My name is Dr. Julia Zion, and I have a great pleasure to welcome you at the opening webinar of the Bloodness um, topic on Focus Cutaneous Lymphoma program. Uh, this educational program is fully granted with uh, seven continuous medical education credit points uh, by the European Board of Accreditation in Hematology, but only for those uh, who participate in all nine sessions and who will feel obligatory, so obligatory to be It's very important, but we'll remind you um, after afterwards. Um, also, what is important that uh, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please write in a chat with a cloud symbol. It's in a blue color. You can um, see the message, test message from Maria Angela, um, my colleague. And please welcome with me the first speakers, uh, Professor Rain uh, Willemze, who will introduce us today to Kutanyu Sinifoma. Um, few words. Um, Rain Vilenze is Emeritus Professor of Dermatology and immediate past chairman of the Department of Dermatology at the Leiden University Medical Center. He is the founder of the Dutch Cutaneous Lymphoma Group, which established Cutaneous Lymphoma WHO classification. Uh, Professor Vilenze has also initiated a national registry with more than 4,800 Cutaneous Lymphoma patients. Uh, additionally, Professor Vilemze serves on the board of many national and international societies, including International Society of Cutaneous Lymphoma, EORTC Cutaneous Lymphoma Group, and he is an honorary member of the European Society of Dermatological Research. Professor Vilemze authored over 450 publications and book chapters. Professor Vilemze, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for your nice uh, introduction. It's very gratifying that more than 230 colleagues have shown their interest and have registered for this course. I hope you can all hear me because the sound of the song was not too good, uh, at least in my microphone. I have no conflict of interest. And here we see the list of forthcoming webinars in the different, uh, for different types of Genius lymphoma, and I have been asked to give a short introduction to this group of rare and peculiar diseases, and I'm glad to do so. What we will discuss are basic concepts in cutaneous lymphoma diagnosis, emphasize why these cutaneous lymphomas are so special and so different from nodal non Hodgkin lymphomas, and we will discuss the history of cutaneous lymphoma classification because classification is really essential here. It dictates the type of treatment, it provides information on clinical course and prognosis, and as we all understand, an incorrect classification will result in an incorrect treatment. This is the history of cutaneous lymphoma classification, and it all started in 1806 with the first description of mycosis phagoides by Ali Bear, and you see the picture of his first patient. What also memorable is 1862 when Bazin described the three tumor stages of mycosis for goiness, patch, a plug in a tumor stage, and it's interesting because it's probably the first description of the multi-step phenomenon of tumor progression and development. These conditions you see on this slide have in common that they are infiltrating the skin, and that those are T-cells, and that led to the uh, concept of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, the term proposed as an encompassing term for those conditions by uh, Adelson and by Lutzner. However, apart from mycosis fungoides and sesquis syndrome, about, there were about 40% of cutaneous lymphoma did not belong to that group. These were classified by pathologists with schemes used for nodal lymphomas 
based purely on morphology. In Europe, the field classification, in the US, the working formulation and others. And in those classifications, no distinction was made between primary and secondary cutaneous lymphomas. In fact, primary cutaneous lymphomas other than MF and sesquary did not exist and they were treated as systemic lymphomas with secondary skin involvement. Here you see the classification that was used when I started about 40 years ago. The kill classification, and you can see it, it makes distinction between low grade and high grade, which simply means small cell and large cell lymphomas, both B cell and T cell, and the only category which refers to skin lymphomas small cerebral form cells of MF and sesquary is depicted in red. That's all. So, what were the new concepts that led to the definition of new lymphomas and new classifications? First, recognition that primary and secondary cutaneous lymphomas are completely different. Second, that the diagnosis can never be based on histology alone. And above all, that clinical presentation is very, very important and can be a major diagnostic adjunct. I give you an example how this works in practice. This is a patient presenting with multiple tumors on the face. The histology showed a centroblastic lymphoma. Nowadays, we would call that the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and the diagnosis was a centroblastic lymphoma. This was the diagnosis, staging revealed skin and lymph node involvement, chemotherapy was given consistent with the diagnosis, and the patient died 32 months after diagnosis of lymphoma. Here we have another patient presenting with a tumorous lesion on the chest surrounded by erythematous lesions, which had developed over the last four years, and again a large cell lymphoma, also a centroblastic lymphoma now of large cleaved cells and multilobated cells. And again, the diagnosis according to the Kiel classification was one of the subtypes of centroblastic lymphoma. That was the diagnosis. Staging was completely negative, but because the diagnosis was centroblastic lymphoma, multi-agent chemotherapy was given. And this patient went into sustained complete remission and never had a relapse. In the years to come and in our archives, we had many similar patients presenting with localized lesions on the trunk, as you can see here, or lesions on, in the face, and especially on the scalp. And this proved a very consistent pattern. Histologically, these lymphomas can be uh, have a diffuse uh, uh, architecture, most of them, some of them are follicular and diffuse, and very rarely they have a purely follicular uh, growth pattern. And uh, it's very important to emphasize that absolutely no difference in prognosis is found between cases with a follicular, a follicular and diffuse and a diffuse growth pattern. So, our conclusion at that time, and of other European groups, that was that these cases that were uh, classified as centroblastic lymphoma were often presented with solitary or localized lesions in the trunk on the face, that they could very well be treated with radiotherapy, as you can see here. Skin relapses occurred in about 30% of cases. However, they don't, did not mean disease progression, because you can easily treat those with low days, those radiotherapy again. Extracutaneous dissemination is uncommon, and these cases have an excellent prognosis. So it was a distinct clinical pathologic entity derived from follicle center, germinal center cells, and we gave it the name primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma. From that time on, it became important to make distinction between primary cutaneous lymphoma, defined as lymphomas presenting in the skin with negative staging procedures at the time of diagnosis, and secondary cutaneous lymphomas in cases presenting with widespread skin and extracutaneous disease, 
or with the history of a, of a systemic lymphoma. Here we see the three different, uh, three major group of B-cell lymphomas. Cases classified as lymphoplasmocytic immunocytoma and acute classification often had this type of lesions and they had an excellent prognosis. And nowadays we call them marginal zone lymphomas. I've shown you already the cases classified as centroblastic, centrocytic, or centroblastic lymphoma. And the third group was classified as centroblastic or immunoblastic, presented on the leg and was called primary continuous diffuse large B cell lymphoma, leg, nowadays leg type. The same in the T cell lymphoma group, these were the entities in the clear classification. T cell lymphomas limited to the skin, non MF, non sessory. Most of them were large cell lymphomas, and distinction could be made between CD30, CD30 positive cases, and they're now known as uh, cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and CD30 negative cases with a very poor prognosis. Now the PTL NOS, and, uh, not otherwise specified, or the aggressive CD8 positive T cell lymphoma. So, these primary cutaneous lymphomas had distinctive clinical features. They had an other clinical behavior and prognosis and therefore required a different type of treatment. But they also had other biologic features. For instance, translocations, the 14-18 translocation in the follicular lymphomas did not occur or rarely occur in those cutaneous cases. The 2-5 translocation of the anaplastic large cell lymphoma is rarely seen in primary cutaneous cases. So these primary cutaneous lymphomas should be included as separate entities in classifications to prevent unnecessarily aggressive therapies. Why are these cases so different? And I think the most important thing is that primary cutaneous lymphomas can be seen with the naked eye and are easily accessible. If you have a nodal lymphoma, you feel a lump or you see a tumor on your CT or on your CT bed, but skin lesions can be seen and there is a wide variety of skin lesions. And you can easily also see and biopsy the extent of the lesions. It then appeared that the different types of cutaneous T and B cell lymphomas have a very characteristic clinical presentation that may be very helpful in diagnosis and classification. I already mentioned to you the presence of the localized skin lesions on the trunk or on the scalp in the follicle center lymphoma. Also, the marginal zone lymphoma, the immunocytomas from the past, often present with multiple lesions localized preferentially on the arms and the upper trunk, as we can see in these cases, or many times, especially on the upper arms. We do not have a good explanation for that. Leg type, of course, mo in most cases presenting on the leg or on the legs, especially in elderly females, but they can also present in a small proportion at all the sides <clears throat> with the same morphology and the same phenotype. Early stage mycosis fungoides is especially localized in those parts of the, of the skin that are non-sun exposed, like the buttocks, the upper legs and the trunk. And this is a very characteristic representation of early stage mycosis fungoides. This is a variant of mycosis fungoides, follicular tropic MF. And in those cases, the, the malignant T cells do not preferentially go into the epidermis, but in the follicular epithelium. In those cases, especially when they have infiltrated lesions, characteristically, infiltrate the eyebrow region with hair loss. And when you see this clinical presentation, it's, it, it's a, a tremendous help to uh, lead the way to the correct diagnosis. Here in the final example, cases presenting with small lesions on the, on the ears with very malignant looking uh, infiltrate, Cases can be clonal, cases have often uh, marker loss, but they typically have an excellent prognosis. 
So another important finding is that different types of cutaneous lymphomas can show an identical histology. It also implies that classification on the basis of histology alone is impossible. For clinicians, this clinical presentation is very suggest suggestive of mycosis fungoides. For pathologists, epidermotropic T cells infiltrating the epidermis in this way is almost equal to a diagnosis of mycosis fungoides. However, this phenomenon is not only seen in mycosis fungoides. We have we have four cases with epidermotropic T-cells. And the question is, which of them is MF? And only one of them is. This case is MF because the clinical picture is consistent with MF. This is an aggressive CD8-positive T-cell lymphoma. And this is a case of lymphomatous papulosis with papules coming and going and an excellent prognosis. And this accumulation of atypical T cells, and they were clonal as well, doesn't belong to a malignant condition, but to lichen sclerosis. Here, uh, I will give you one other example. Here, a case with presenting with diffuse, with, uh, diffuse infiltrate of large anaplastic cells and nodules and ulcerated lesions on the left upper leg. Is logically highly suggestive of an anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And that would be the diagnosis in the past. And that would perhaps be the diagnosis for an inexperienced pathologist. Staging was negative. However, we know that these diffuse CD30 positive infiltrates can be seen in a large variety of conditions. In the anaplastic large cell lymphoma, in lymphomas of papulosis, in transformed MF, in systemic anaplastic large cell lymphomas, and in still other conditions. So an experienced pathologist will not make a diagnosis here, but simply say it's a diffuse CD30 positive infiltrate. My main differential diagnosis because of negative staging procedures is a cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma or transformed MF, and he will ask the clinician for additional information. And the clinician will see that the patient had this type of eczematous lesions, which on biopsy were typical of early stage mycosis fungoides. So finally, the final diagnosis is a transformed mycosis fungoides. And that diagnosis can only be made on the basis of a combination of clinical, histological, and phenotypical data. Treatment radiotherapy for the tumor, topical steroids for the patches, and this was the follow-up of this patient. So, a histologic diagnosis, other than in the past, is only differential diagnosis. It's not the final diagnosis. The clinical pathological correlation is essential. Next, cutaneous T cell lymphoma is not a diagnosis. All these cases have in common that their skin limited T cell lymphomas uh, presenting in the skin. Mycosis fungoides, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, lymphomatous papulosis, peripheral T cell lymphoma not otherwise specified, cutaneous gamma delta lymphoma. And what we can see, if you look at the five-year survival of these cases, it's completely different. So that means you should not, and that's depicted here, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is not a diagnosis. It refers to a group of cases. cases. And it also means if you read a paper on 40 cutaneous T-cell lymphomas without further specification, Without knowledge which type of T cell lymphoma it is, it's not very useful to read it. Finally, the fact that these primary cutaneous lymphomas are so easily accessible also has therapeutic consequences. It means it is very important that, that there are skin directed therapies. Early mycosis fungoides can be treated with topical steroids with topical cytostatics like nitrogen mustard or different types of phototherapy. 
and many types of, of, of localized or solar treat uh, cutaneous lymphomas like anaplastic large cell lymphoma or follicle center lymphomas or marginal zone lymphomas can be treated with radiotherapy. So this summarizes those new concepts. Primary cutaneous and secondary cutaneous lymphomas are completely different. The histologic diagnosis is not the final diagnosis and clinical pathologic correlation is essential in diagnosis and classification. Together, this led to new types of cutaneous T cell lymphoma and cutaneous B cell lymphoma into new classifications. This simply lists a number of uh, lymphomas that were defined by different European groups in the 80s and in the 90s. And these conditions should be, but were not included as distinct entities in the malignant lymphoma classifications. And therefore, the EOTC group came up with an own classification for primary cutaneous lymphoma. It just contained the conditions that we had defined in the 10 years before. T-cell lymphomas with an indolent and aggressive uh, behavior, B-cell lymphomas with an indolent or intermediate behavior and provisional entities. It was the first classification for primary cutaneous lymphomas. It recognized distinct disease entities. It made distinction for the first time between indolent, intermediate and aggressive types of cutaneous lymphomas. And the clinical relevance was validated on more than 1,300 patients. However, there was great reluctance among hematopathologists to accept organ-specific classification, and, and that's understandable. So in 2004, the WHO and the ERTC groups came together and produced a consensus classification known as the WHO ERTC classification for cutaneous lymphomas. Again, a classification purely for cutaneous lymphomas and therefore not widely used by hematopathologists at that time. And that is shown in this slide. <clears throat> it simply lists the classifications from 1988 till the day, till today. In red, the classifications that were purely uh, meant for primary cutaneous lymphomas. And these columns indicate if they were used by dermatologists, by pathologists, or hematologist. And you see that ESDR classification was used by dermatologists and by part of the pathologists, especially those in the cutaneous lymphoma centers. However, the WHO classification was used for, used by pathologists and hematologists. The WHO ERTC classification, which appeared in a separate skin book, was mainly used by dermatologists and pathologists and not as much by hematologists. And starting from 2008, when the entities from the WHO E2C classification were introduced and integrated in the WHO classification, then we all used the same classification as basis for treatment. And I summarized it in this slide and with the question, how were primary cutaneous lymph uh, follicle center lymphomas, and how were cutaneous anaplastic uh, lymphomas treated? Guidelines from, from, the, from the cutaneous lymphoma centers indicated already from the late 80s that they should be treated with radiotherapy. However, most oncologists and hematologists treated those cases with an Arbor 1E disease with three CHOP courses in combination with radiotherapy. And only starting from 2008, when everyone accepted this classification, they were treated in much more centers uh, with radiotherapy alone. So this is the current update of the WHO classific uh, AOTC classification. In red, you see either new entities, or entities in which name has been changed, and altogether we have about 12 uh, T-cell lymphomas and three main group of B-cell lymphomas and two very rare uh, subgroups. 
these are the articles in which these uh, these are the two uh, WHO blue books, and these are the articles in which these two classifications, which are almost identical, uh, are described. And in the uh, blood paper uh, reporting on the update of the WHO EU2C classification, there's also a list uh, indicating the frequency and the five years survival of the different groups of lymphomas. Hematologists know that of the nodal lymphomas, about 90% is B-cell lymphoma and T-cell lymphomas are extremely rare. And you might uh, be aware that for primary cutaneous lymphomas, 75% are T-cell lymphomas and B-cell lymphomas are very rare. What will be done in the, in the next uh, uh, webinars is that these different groups of lymphomas will be uh, described in much, much more detail. So to sum up, cutaneous lymphomas are a heterogeneous group of rare diseases. Cutaneous T-cell lymphomas are much more common than cutaneous B-cell lymphomas. You should remember that CTCL is not a diagnosis but it refers to a group of diseases with different treatment and prognosis. And the histologic diagnosis is not the final diagnosis. It's a differential diagnosis. And cutaneous lymphomas are defined by a combination of histological, phenotypical, genetic, and clinical criteria. And especially clinical presentation and the localization of the skin lesions is often a major diagnostic engine. The fact that the histologic diagnosis is not a final diagnosis also means that if the clinician fails to provide appropriate clinical information, the pathologist will never be able to make a definite diagnosis. And that brings, my, brings me to my take-home message, and it indicates that clinical pathology correlation and a multidisciplinary approach form the basis of cutaneous lymphoma diagnosis and classification are, and are a prerequisite for correct management and treatment. And I think if this is the only slide you remember, I will be very glad because it's the most important sentence of the whole presentation. Here we see the next presentations and here you see all the cutaneous lymphoma experts which will describe the diff and, and report to you the different subgroups of cutaneous lymphomas, but in the end, two presentations on new therapeutic developments. I thank you for your attention, and there is now room for questions. Thank you all very much, Professor Willemse, for this comprehensive um, uh, session. Um, yes, I encourage the audience to ask the questions and write them. And I see the questions. The first question is, is radiotherapy used at the same doses for all cutaneous lymphomas? Uh, I think that's a very interesting, interesting question because uh, that's changing. In the past, almost for all in 40 gray were used, and now radiotherapy as a primary uh, option, as a therapeutic, with a therapeutic, uh, as a therapeutic option, for instance, for follicocentral lymphomas or for anaplastic partial lymphomas, 20 to 24 gray is used. For Palliative treatment, that means relapses of low-grade uh, malignant B-cell lymphomas, or for skin tumors or of, of mycosis fungoides, much lower doses are used. We normally use two, 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 uh, two times two gray for case B-cell lymphomas in the palliative fashion, and eight gray for low-grade cutaneous T-cell lymphomas in the palliative fashion. And when that does not survive, and that's exceptional, then we go again to 20 gray. Will the slides be provided? Yes, the slides will, will be provided. Don't be shy. It's a special time for, for you to ask anything. Now, when a patient has a, in, in case of multiple lesions, then uh, I think uh, always the most representative lesion should be biopsied. 
and that means that that that, that requires an experienced eye, because for instance, in follicotropic MF, it's very easy to biopsy a lesion on the on the, on the trunk, and uh, but the most representative lesion will be biopsied from the eyebrow region, where the infiltration of the hair follicles is. So. In general, you biopsy from a representative site. The most infiltrated and the most active lesion, and for instance, in lymphomatous papulosis, you will biopsy a juicy papule and not a, a, a papule which has already disappeared in part. So it and 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 sometimes you need to biopsy several lesions. For instance, if you uh, wish to uh, distinguish between cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma and, and, and mycosis fungoides, then you should not only biopsy the tumor where the anaplastic large cell infiltrate is present, but also the eczematous lesions to see if you're dealing with, uh, with a mycosis fungoides. So it's not a simple answer. It depends on the disease uh, uh, that, you, that you biopsy. Do you follow up patients with LYP for risk of possible progression of disease? Yes, the advice we give, and there is just a beautiful series of more than 500 patients published in the Journal of the uh, uh, European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, it, it exactly gives the risk you have to develop and other type of lymphoma, and the advice is uh, lifelong uh, uh, surveillance, but in practice, it's not always done, I should say. Yeah, the question is, my coach can go, this is a systemic disease. I think that can be answered by Professor Vermeer in the next session. Of course, when you have uh, skin lesions all over the body, then it's hard to believe that you have not circulating uh, neoplastic cells. And that, but then you end up in a semantic discussion what is a primary cutaneous lymphoma or what is a skin-limited lymphoma. So I think that the, the malignant cells find the correct environment to proliferate in the skin, and, uh, but there will undoubtedly cells in the peripheral blood, but that does not mean you should treat them. Treatment for pruritus, well, perhaps also for Professor Vermeer. I know he's listening, and, and for Professor Bargo for the next webinar on MF and especially on Sesquit syndrome, because that will be a lengthy answer. Yeah, gene rearrangement analysis. Uh, I will say we do it rarely. It's uh, mandatory to make a diagnosis of Sesquit syndrome to distinguish between early mycosis fungoides and a reactive condition, I don't think it's not very useful because in many uh, B9 cases, I also find a clone. And uh, some people say if you find an identical clone in two different lesions, it's more proof that it's really an, an cutaneous T cell lymphoma. But I think you should be very... Uh, the experience is that, that uh, when you have only a, a small suspicion uh, but you do find a clone that most pathologists will make uh, a diagnosis of cutaneous T cell lymphoma on the basis of the clone. I don't think that's correct. So we are very cautious in that. Yeah, when writing the pathology report, do you call the lesions atypical lymphocytic infiltration or call them MF? Uh, that depends. I, I must say, uh, for me, it's easy because I always see the, or, or in most patients, we see both the clinical and the histological uh, 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 abnormalities. But... Uh, yeah, if you're not certain if you have an atypical infiltrate and, and, and you're not completely uh, certain if the cutaneous lymphoma, we just say it's an atypical uh, lymphocytic infiltrate that we want to see the clinical presentation to, to make a more definite diagnosis. 
And sometimes you just end up with a suspicion of Danish T cell lymphoma, and, and that's it. CT or PET CT, that's also, I think, an answer that should be given for the different uh, conditions. In general, uh, I think in, 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 in most conditions that can be done, early stage MF, not lymphomatous papillosis, not, and I have serious doubt of the primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphomas, at least the, the class switched IgG positive cases if that uh, should, should be done. But I think that should be answered in the next uh, uh, webinars on the specific uh, conditions. Are there a role for topical or systemic treatments after radiotherapy for histologic with high relapse rate? Yes, certainly. And often in com combination with, uh, with other therapies. Yeah, oh, the, indeed the question about the electrodermic MF and accessory, I leave that to the next two webinars because that's a very, uh, very difficult area uh, and, and then you come deeply in what are the diagnostic criteria for accessory syndrome and that's a, that's a lengthy answer. When do you decide that topical steroid therapy is not effective and is there a maximum time you can treat a MF patient with topical steroids? No, and I think every dermatologist with experience in skin lymphomas with early MF uh, knows that patients with early stage 1A MF can use uh, topical steroid for a long time or you can follow an expectant, even an expectant policy and and only use uh, uh, topical steroids in a symptomatic way. A couple of days a week, three times a week, two times a week. And sometimes people accept not to be treated for a couple of months. And when there is a slight exacerbation, you can do it again. And I do not believe there is a maximum time. And you can continue in this intermittent way for decades because most patients will not progress at all. Molecular investigations in the diagnosis. Well, of course, clonality is mandatory. You should have the same clone, uh, preferably in the skin and in the peripheral blood. And uh, pre accessory and uh, well, I would say in some cases you have the, the <clears throat> idea that it, it's, it, it's, it's really a pre accessory but you are not completely meet the criteria. But uh, I think that is uh, uh, really a question for uh, Martin Bago and Professor Vermeer to answer in the next two uh, webinars. And I think that also many new, many new uh, para uh, flow cytometric <coughs> uh, parameters will be discussed, which will help you to, to, uh, to make the, the area of the precessory as small as possible. The CATO3 in the Tibet in the diagnosis of MS and accessory, no, we don't do it routinely. And uh, that can be done to make the distinction between Th1 and Th2 lymphocytes. It's not in our uh, diagnostic panel. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I think the marginal, the marginal zone lymphoma is, is uh, very interesting. Because that is, I think, the only uh, condition which is uh, included in, in different ways in the, WO, the 2016 uh, revision of the WHO classification and the more specific uh, 2018 update of the WHO ERTC classification. And uh, I think that will also be discussed by uh, the uh, experts which will discuss the low-grade uh, malignant B-cell lymphomas, but uh, if you look at the WHO, the, the revision of the, two, of the WHO 2016, those primary cutaneous cases are simply included in the broad group of extranodal uh, mild lymphomas, the extranodal marginal zone lymphomas. 
and 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 those cases are IgM positive. Uh, they are they consist of monocytoid B cells. Uh, they're very B cell rich. They're CX3 positive, and they have very specific features. And when you look at the primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphomas, 90% of them are class switched. They are not IgM. They are IgG. They, are, they uh, do not consist of marginal zone or monocytoid B cells, but simply of uh, lymphoplasmacytoid cells and plasma cells. And they have an excellent prognosis. And it, I, I can hardly recall uh, any patients that transformed or, or progressed to, to more serious disease. And uh, these class switched cases have such an enormous overlap with uh, cutaneous lymphoid hyperplasia that I really have doubt that these are really uh, uh, an, an, a frank malignancy. I think about 10% of the skin-limited cutaneous marginal zone lymphomas are IgM positive, are non-class switched, and they are very similar as the mild lymphomas, but it's only a small minority. <clears throat> now, this is very intriguing, and uh, it, it's in part in a semantic discussion. It's also uh, a controversial issue. Uh, I showed the, the six ears with a small papule on an earlobe in combination with a highly uh, malignant infiltrate, which is clonal in most cases, which show uh, marker loss in most cases. And uh, so histologically, it's purely malignant. And uh, apart from a very low uh, proliferation rate, and the, the problem is, I would prefer to call it a T cell uh, lymphoproliferative disease. We never stage those patients. We treat them with interleukin steroids or low dose radiotherapy. The point is that the histology is so malignant that the hematopathologist uh, prefer to use the, the term lymphoma for these cases. And I must say there is one case published by the Milan group which uh, uh, presented with these uh, ear lesions and had progressive disease 30, 30 years after follow-up. And that's the only reported case, and that was also reason to call it lymphoma, but in most cases it really behaves like a uh, B9 lymphoproliferative disease. But it's contra a controversial issue. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Willems, uh, for this uh, comprehensive um, webinar session and also for a really great discussion. Uh, thank you to you and the whole audience. And of course, uh, I also would like to encourage you to uh, sign in to Eurobloodnet newsletter where you have the summary of all of the initiatives we are working on at the moment. And of course, please follow us on Europe Bloodnet uh, on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Willemze, for leading this wonderful webinar today. And hope to see you the 8th of June. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye.